I'm Dana Eastman. I am the manager of Canyon Vista's RV Resort out in Gold Canyon for uh, Calam Resorts. And also this year, I will be your um, mixology uh, professor. Um, we are going to delve into the world of vodka. Uh, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with vodka. Everyone loves a, a, a James Bond martini every now and then. And we'll talk about that later. Um, but vodka is actually um, the oldest distilled spirit that we currently use on today's back bar. Um, it's been around since uh, the seventh or eighth century. And there's some debate where it uh, originated in Eastern Europe. Um, Poles claim that it's, uh, it's their creation. And Russians, of course, claim it as uh, nectar of the czars. So wherever it uh, originated, the first commercial distillery that we're aware of um, was in Russia. Um, and it's dated to like 1174 or somewhere around there. Um, the vodka that was produced then is really nothing like the vodka that um, we drink and are familiar with today. It was actually referred to as pulgar, which in Russian means bread wine, because it was basically originally distilled from... Um, not really a dough, but the mash was uh, very yeasty and it was pretty much made with uh, flour or wheat at the time. And we'll talk more about the different uh, bases that are used for the vodka fermentation today. Um, but it was primarily used as a, a medicinal sort of thing. It was kind of, it cured what ailed you. Um, it was cloudy, um, very yeasty, very doughy, bready. Um, but it was uh, strong, as strong or stronger than it is today. And vodka, by law in the States, has to be 40% alcohol, which is 80 proof. And in Europe, it's slightly lower, but it is a fairly potent potable. Um, and it's uh, become wildly popular. Um, and uh, it really didn't gain notoriety or popularity outside of Europe, i.e. in the States, until the 30s. Um, there were a couple of outliers. On the West Coast, there was uh, a hotel where the Martini was born, and I'll talk about that a little later. But there was also um, a bar in New Orleans that created the Russian cocktail uh, in the early 1900s, late 1800s. And the Russia cocktail is a mixture of vodka and uh, a very bitter berry cordial. Um, uh, we are going to start with the way vodka is distilled today. Um, it's the national drink of Poland, Russia, Sweden, and Finland. Um, and it can be made with a variety of uh, base materials for the mash. It traditionally um, was made with potato or wheat. Um, wheat in countries where wheat is grown, and not as kind of a luxury crop, but as a staple. Um, and potatoes in places like the colder regions of Russia, where it's very hard um, to propagate wheat, and wheat's primarily used to make bread. Uh, the um, US started uh, corn production, and it's also made with rye some places. So any grain really can be distilled into what we think of as vodka. Vodka is a, a clear, um, somewhat neutral spirit. It's a great base for cocktails because it's a blank palette with a lot of spirits like uh, rum. You have a, a sweetness that's, that's just uh, inherent in all rums, whether they're ambers, darks, or, or silver rum. Gin, you have lots of botanical flavor, and that's, that's what drives the flavor profile of gin. Bourbon, whiskeys of all sorts have characteristics they take from the wood, as well as uh, the aging process. As they mature, the flavor matures. Vodka is a clear spirit. <laughs> Traditionally, it's not aged. It's not casked at all. So it doesn't, you, it doesn't take any flavor from the wood. It's great for cocktails of all sorts because 
it becomes whatever you want it to. Uh, it's actually um, one, of, one of my favorite drinks. Uh, in Eastern Europe, um, vodka is primarily consumed or was traditionally consumed uh, straight um, to appreciate the, the way it enhanced food consumption. So to that end, it's almost always accompanied by hors d'oeuvres. Um, vodka can either be served at room temperature or a lot of times it's, it's frozen. You see uh, there are ice bars that have blocks of ice on the bar with uh, holes or they're made in a mold. So the vodka is kept in those. Lots of us have uh, a handle of Absolute or Kettle One if we're you know, high steppers in our freezer. And it is just fantastic, super, super cold. And the traditional accompaniments are smoked fish, canapes, salted herring. I don't think we eat a lot of salted herring here. Caviar is wonderful with vodka. A uh, little blini with some sour cream and a little dollop of, uh, well, I can't afford beluga, but um, there's great Ocetra out there. There's even uh, U.S. caviar. Um, it's paddlefish roe that's really affordable, um, and it's, it's the pop of the berries and the saltiness that you're looking for there, and vodka is just beautiful with those. The production of vodka uh, has... Uh, in the modern world has advanced in that it goes through a multiple distillation and then a filtration process that pulls out the cloudiness that uh, we saw with the, um, the pulgar or bread wine. Uh, and it's crystal clear, as you can see. It's produced in uh, a lot of different countries as well as there are a lot of domestic vodka producers now. We have seen an explosion with the boutique spirits movement of U.S. vodka producers. There are several in Arizona. Tito's is maybe one of the most well-known U.S. vodkas. Uh, it's made in Texas. Um, Kettle One is made in Poland. Uh, and Bregus is French. There are lots and lots of vodkas produced in lots of countries, and there are all kinds of different bases that they use. Uh, vodka made from potatoes is very popular. Belvedere is one of the most well-known of those. Kettle One, Tito's, and uh, Bregus are all made from wheat, uh, primarily winter wheat, very soft uh, wheat that, that just uh, distills well, and uh, the character is crystal clear and uh, wonderful. So vodka made it to the States primarily after Prohibition and after World War I. It came back with uh, the soldiers who, you know, in cantinas, vodka is actually pretty cheap uh, in, in Europe or was at the time compared to other spirits because it's easy to make. Uh, there's no aging required. There's no costly additional ingredients like the botanicals that are in gin. Um, brandy, which was a very popular uh, amber spirit in Europe at the time, is made from grapes. And it's, it's wood cast and well, consequently very expensive. So vodka was a, a great cheap tipple for GIs of that time period. And it came back to the U.S. in the 30s and became wildly popular along with gin. Um, so let's talk about cocktails in general. Before we get along to actually making the cocktails, the word cocktail is uh, kind of odd. I, I, I've always, or I had always wondered exactly where it came from. And there are several different theories. One is that an Aztec noble had a, uh, a, a daughter named Princess Chotil, and he uh, ordered her to serve a mixed drink to a guest, and her name became the name of the drink in their language, and as uh, Europeans migrated to the New World, it somehow made it into the lexicon of uh, the soldiers, and it went back to Europe, and this is plausible, but probably not exactly how it happened. It's a great fable. Um, there's uh, are others that include, you know, um, barkeeps and innkeepers who 
would stir drinks with uh, peacock plumes or feathers of the poultry that they had. Um, so it became a cocktail because they used a cock's tail to stir it. Um, the, uh, the word uh, coquetel in French it means egg cup. And in uh, New Orleans, at the turn of the 19th century, there was a guy named Peshaud who invented a bitters that is uh, probably most commonly known in the Sazerac cocktail from New Orleans. He served his cocktails, uh, which were primarily vodka and Peshaud, in an egg cup. So the mispronunciation of the French word was cocktail. So it became cocktail that way. Plausible again, but what most scholars, I guess, if there are scholars of, of, uh, of spirits, um, believe the origination is, is um, a horse with a docked tail um, was generally a racehorse, a thoroughbred that was mixed with another breed. Um, so this was kind of, uh, it morphed into a, a cocktail is a mixture of spirits or a mixture of a spirit with something else. It's an altered spirit. So they think that's kind of how it came, but I'm sure it's a combination of these things and it's, it's how everything forms, you know? Um, it, just, it just becomes normal. And now a gin and tonic, a martini, um, a rum and coke, they're all cocktails. So it's fun to just theorize exactly how that came to be. Um, all right, before we start mixing cocktails, I thought I'd, I'd talk a little bit about probably the most famous cocktail um, or one of the most famous cocktails is the martini. And the martini started out as, as a gin cocktail. Uh, it was two parts gin, one part uh, dry vermouth, um, generally stirred and poured into an up glass or what we now today call a martini glass. So um, vodka martinis, wildly popular, I'm a fan, uh, are the same ratio two to one vodka to dry vermouth shaken in an up glass, generally with a twist of lemon or with uh, an olive or olives. Um, I love to graze through uh, the olive bars at the upscale markets, the fries, which I don't know whether it's upscale or not, it depends on uh, your, your frame of reference, uh, but they have a wonderful prepared food section and they have a, a Murray's, um, counter. And Murray's is a, a, a cheesemonger from New York. Um, they have all kinds of just fantastic cheeses, cured meats, um, really, really killer stuff. And as a, a component of this, they have a huge olive bar that has all kinds of marinated olives. And they have um, these uh, piquillo peppers, which are small Italian peppers. They're sweet and generally they're marinated and it's not too oily to put in a drink but you can get them stuffed with cream cheese and they make a wonderful garnish for a martini. I like to buy them unstuffed and I get Borson from Costco because I'm cheap. And I just take a little like teaspoon and I fill them up with Borson. And it's like an hors d'oeuvre and a drink all in one. So that's fun stuff as well. Um, martinis, uh, you know, um, there are lots of theories about what the perfect way to make a martini is. Some people like it with no vermouth. Some people like it with just a hair of vermouth. And um, the Churchill martini, named after Winston Churchill, he said famously that he pours a, a glass of gin over ice, stirs gently, pours into a glass while looking vaguely in the direction of France with an unopened bottle of vermouth next to him. And that's the perfect martini, according to Winston. And, you know, who knows? He may be right. Last note on martinis. I, uh, there was a lovely lady who was a big part of our life when we were kids. She was one of my uh, grandmother's best friends from childhood. They grew up in the same neighborhood, lived in the same town their whole life. And um, my Aunt Betty, we called her Aunt Betty. There was, there was no real family tie, but she was at every family function. And she was... Uh, the life of the party all the time until she was in a wheelchair. 
she would get up and dance and she would be the last one off the floor. And at her little tiny apartment, she, she never married. Um, it was rumored that during prohibition, she was uh, betrothed or engaged to um, a, a, a bootlegger, a guy who ran um, illegal liquor and he was pinched and went to jail and she was the love of her life and it just never worked out and she never married. So she lived alone in a small apartment, but it was, you know, nicely furnished and she had a lot of older lady things, a lot of tchotchkes, a lot of really important mementos to her. And there was a story behind each one of them. And I would go over and sit with her and have a martini every now and then. And she would mix it like Winston um, she liked a gin martini. She would mix it with, you know, a little ice and a little, uh, she had a glass similar to this, but it had some sort of gold filigree on it. And it was very deco and, you know, it was just one of those things. And she would pour the martini into two up glasses and she had a perfume atomizer that was full of vermouth. And she would give one squirt to each glass and drop an olive in and that was it. And she was, uh, she was a fun lady, and every time I drink a martini, I think about her. So here's to you, Betty. All right, on to the cocktails. Um, ice is in the cooler. Ice is in the cooler, great. Um, unless anybody, I mean, if anybody has any questions or wants to interject something, um, now's a great time. If not, I'm game to keep talking. Which, the left side? Uh, right side. Right side. Yes. I'm, good. I'm gonna get ice. <laughs> Right. All right, so uh, the Gimlet. The Gimlet started life like the Martini as a gin cocktail. Um, and there are two uh, theories as to why it's called a Gimlet. The first one is uh, a ship's doctor named Sir uh, Thomas Gimlet started serving it to sailors um, as a way to get them to drink citrus. Uh, because citrus, as I, I'm pretty sure we all know, they used to eat a lot of citrus to prevent scurvy on long sea voyages because the lack of vitamin C would be very bad and cause them to uh, have a lot of dental problems as well as other things. And the sailors couldn't work when they were ailing. So in order to get them to eat citrus or drink citrus, they mixed it with strong spirits and uh, that's how the name Gimlet was born, according to one school of thought. Another school of thought is that there's a, uh, an awl or an auger called a Gimlet that's used to drill holes through ship's hulls. So a Gimlet's called a Gimlet because of its piercing nature. I don't know. Um, I think it's probably the Sir Thomas Gimlet, but we'll see. All right, so to make a, a vodka Gimlet, what we're gonna do is start with ice in a shaker. All right, so we're going to squeeze three quarters of the lime into the glass. Should be about an ounce. Any kind of uh, method of squeezing is fine. This one's just my choice to work out some of my frustrations. But the little squeezers like this are great. My wife has a little um, automated one that she uses. All right, so that's about an ounce of lime juice. We're gonna do two ounces of vodka. Let's use the kettle for this one. Quarter ounce of simple syrup. A little more if you like it sweeter. Generally make it fairly sweet. Right. 
and then a quick shake. Up glass. And a little wedge for garnish. And there you have it. A vodka gimlet. All right. I like this one on the patio. The first one of these I had was at a place called the Cheshire Inn in St. Louis. Um, it was a big old Tudor hotel. Uh, and there was a bartender there named Mark, and I can't remember what his last name was, but he was, to this day, the most knowledgeable mixologist that I've ever run into. Um, and I met him when I was probably about, I don't know, 18 or 19, because, well, that's how St. Louis works, you know, we start young. Um, but I lived there until I was in my early 30s. And it was a regular um, special Saturday night place. You know, there it was in the theater district. So we would go see a play or the symphony or I was never a big opera or ballet guy, but um, it was always a stop because at the end of the night, you know, you could sit and have a perfectly crafted cocktail and just shoot the breeze with somebody who was uh, fun to talk to and knowledgeable about everything beverage oriented. You know, I have no idea what sort of person he was, whether he had kids or anything else about him, but man, going in there and just sitting down and talking about um, what to drink, how to drink it and why to drink it was fantastically fun. All right, um, we'll move along to the French martini, um, which is a creation of the 80s. And I'm not 100% on this, but I'm pretty sure that it predates the um, ubiquitous Cosmopolitan. Um, the Cosmo, I always associate with uh, Sex in the City, but it was around way before that. Um, but this is, in my opinion, kind of a more sophisticated Cosmo drink. Uh, the Cosmo being uh, vodka, a little bit of simple syrup, or some people just use uh, Rose's lime juice. Um, if you use simple syrup, squeeze lime, little cranberry, shake, 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 up glass. Um, this is something like that, but it's got more body. Uh, and the reason is it's Chambord, which if you're unfamiliar, is a wonderful uh, French raspberry liqueur. Um, very syrupy, very sweet. Um, there's a very small amount of it in this. So we won't use any simple syrup because it's, it's already quite sweet. Little pineapple juice and vodka. Um, we'll mix it up and see what you think. We'll go with Tito's on this one. It'll be an American French martini. Oh, sorry, a Texas French martini. Couple ounces of vodka. And again, if you weren't in the last class, this is uh, a wonderful little bar measuring cup. It's from OXO. You can get them in any grocery store, really. Uh, just super cool for measuring. You can also use it for oil, um, things that you use in cooking because it's got tablespoons as well as ounces. All right. Half an ounce of Chambord. an ounce and a half of pineapple juice. All right.
And just as a side note for you too, Dana. Yes. If you end up with extra chamois. Yes. It is delicious over French vanilla ice cream or vanilla bean ice cream. Well. It is wonderful. <laughs> and we sometimes uh, will use chamois and vanilla and you can use vodka, but I really like to use um, an eau de vie or just a, like a, uh, an eau de vie is a, a brandy that's made from fruit. Uh, you may know Slivovitz from Poland. Uh, a little bit, so a shot of that, a shot of Schomburg, vanilla ice cream, and a little bit of cream and a blender. It is the best late night milkshake ever. <laughs> there we go, and the French martini. Now we're gonna do a drink that um, I, is new to me. Um, it's called the Grand Fizz or Le Grand Fizz. Um, it's a Grey Goose invention. Um, and the tagline that they give it is the art of summering needs an artful cocktail. So it's, it is very fresh, very wonderful. If you like spritzers, um, probably be a great drink for you. Lovely, uh, I guess, um, alternative to the, the goose and soda with a lemon squeeze. A um, little bit of sweetness, not too much, maybe not the right drink if you're keto, but it's fantastic. All right, so we do an oversized glass. I'm gonna use a stemless wine glass because when we were RVing, um, man, stemmed glasses just had uh, a life expectancy of zero in our coach. So we had all stemless and uh, it worked out well, so, you know, as long as they keep making big ones, I'll be happy. Um, all right, it says to squeeze in three lime wedges, but I think what we're gonna do is just squeeze a whole lime. And they're not, they don't tell you to do it in a shaker, but I'm gonna go ahead and do it in a shaker um, just because it'll mix everything other than the Perrier really thoroughly. And then we'll pour it over a little ice in the glass and add the Perrier to it and some lime wedges. All right, and we're gonna go ahead and use the goose because Lance brought it and I might as well open it. So um, Lance uh, was kind enough to provide all the tipples for making these drinks. So I, I feel like I, I need to use them. Um, so anyway, goose, uh, about an ounce and a half. Um, you know, I would say more like two ounces, just because, you know, you don't want to be stingy. The French economy's having a rough time right now. We should help them out. All right. Um, one part Saint Germain. So Saint Germain is an elderflower liqueur. Um, as you might expect, it's kind of floral, but it's very light, um, sort of jasmine, uh, just very tasty addition. It's sweet. It's, it's simple syrup with a floral nature. So we'll touch that to bring springtime and summer to the cocktail. And this is not hard to find. Um, I got this one at Bash's. Uh, I, I always buy small ones because I, I don't drink it in any sort of quantity. Um, it's a little spendy, but there are cheaper ones out there, but they, they really don't have um, a big bountiful floral nature like this one does. So it's worth the splurge. And I think this was like 13 or $14. So not too bad. Right, we're gonna give this a quick shake and it's gonna go in the glass over ice. Um, yeah, it's fairly popular in cocktails today. Right over ice.
the lime wedges and a little Perrier over the top. Voila, the grand phase. Well, I believe we've reached the end of the class and I've had fun. I hope you have as well. And I'll see you next month.